Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is the FIDE Grand Swiss being held in Riga, Latvia to determine who is going to be playing in the candidates uh, on both the men's and the women's candidate cycles, the World Championship cycle. So we're going to cover some games from rounds five and six today, and the video is called what it's called because, well, you're going to learn a few things about beating Grandmasters, and maybe you can go put it to, to, to use. Um, so the first game that I have to show for you is Ivan Sharic versus Alexei Shirov. This was uh, round five, and um, this was a really fascinating game. So Sharic with the white pieces begins with e4, uh, and we get a uh, Rui Lopez. Uh, there's obviously many, many def uh, ways to play this defense, uh, and uh, a6, bishop a4, knight f6 is the main line, and Sharic castles. Now black can play, I mean, takes bishop e7, b5 in some order, uh, and Shirov plays this extremely popular version of the modern Arkhangelsk, which is bishop c5. Uh, bishop b7 is considered uh, just the traditional Ar Arkhangelsk. This is known as the more modern version of putting the bishop on c5 before you actually commit the bishop on c8. At least that's what it's, I think, called. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, well, now theory goes in a few directions, but this bishop is a little bit of a target. Uh, since white has not naturally played the move knight to c3 yet, white is going to play c3 and d4. And that kind of looks a little stupid for black to put the bishop on c5, but it's not. It's not stupid at all. Uh, and black actually, in many ways, hopes that white overextends. So a4, first Sharic plays a4 to try to soften this up. Black plays a nice move here. Um, rook to b8, so a, b, a, b, you do not blunder a rook. Now, 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 now uh, the next few moves uh, almost look like they don't make any sense, okay? So, d4, that makes sense, but for black. Uh, bishop b6, now a5, and bishop a7. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? I mean, what, we, we, we make a stop at every destination, right? So, first of all, when you force your opponent to play a5, they cannot take on b5 anymore. So, a takes b5, um, a takes b5, and, and, and this pawn can't really be won, um, or else everybody would be playing like this, but theory has proven that this variation is, is okay because black has sufficient play in the form of attacks on the center like ed4, various bishop g4s, uh, knight a5s, I mean th th there's a lot of active counterplay here for black, uh, so which is why Sharic plays h3, bishop b7, and now in this position white has a choice, white can either play rook e1 defending the e4 pawn which is still hanging, or white can play bishop 2e3. And Sharic plays bishop 2e3. Now, believe it or not, Sharic has actually played this position with white before. In fact, for the next like seven moves, Sharic played the position with white, which is fascinating. Uh, so I don't, I mean, I assume Shirov knew this, I assume, but uh, in 2019, Sharic played against Katerina Lag uh, Lagno. A strong Russian grandmaster, and the game went knight e4, rook to e1, so black takes the pawn, but now has to hold on tight. Now black actually, in a very counterintuitive fashion, opens up the e-file. But the idea is that um, if, for example, bishop takes d4, what's to happen here? Knight takes d4, and oopsie daisies, now that Archangel's bishop comes in handy and it actually defends the center, so all of black's position makes sense. CD4, now black plays D5. It looks like black has just simply gotten away with an extra pawn and holds together everything in the center. But white has enough counterplay with knight D2. And this is what Sharic played in that game. Black plays knight E7, covering up the king and also now the bishop and the pawn defend together. Uh, and we have takes takes. And so Sharic, uh, I apologize, it wasn't uh, up until move 19. It was up until move 17. So Sharic had this position before and every game in the database went knight G5. At which point bishop d5 was played, bishop takes d5, and queen takes d5, I believe. This is how, or maybe knight takes d5, but I think queen d5. Uh, and uh, in this game, Sharic played a move that's never been played before, knight e5. But he thought about it. Like, he thought many minutes. It, it w I don't think this was preparation. I think he was uh, improvising at the board. So black castles. Uh, now, knight takes f7 just doesn't make much sense, because you do not give away two pieces like this for the rook. This is a losing position for white. Uh... Two pieces are better than a rook nine times out of ten. So white plays queen g4. Nice move. I mean, he has a lot of active pieces, but so does black. I mean, black has good pressure on the center, good defense, but needs to play one more precise move, and that's bishop d5. You, you have to trade white's bishop. It's just too strong. So takes, takes, rook c1. And, you know, it looks like actually black has a kind of an unpleasant position here because 
C7 looks like it could be weak. A6 looks like it could be weak. I don't really know where this knight is going to go. This bishop seems better than this bishop. But it's actually not so true at all. Um, black has so much activity here. And uh, the best move apparently here was like bishop h6 or something. Uh, not to, to force knight g6 because of g6, of course, you take the rook. Knight g6. And um, I forgot the engine was giving like, then you go here. And then you take, and then you take e4, and then there's a big trade of pieces, or something. I mean, and it's like saying you can't do anything. But because Shadish played it like this, now black plays c5. And there's moments in chess games where you go, oh, the thing that I thought was weak, that all of my play was going to be based upon, is actually not weak at all. Now we have a problem. Because if you take this pawn, this knight hangs. So naturally, Sharaj didn't do... What? Well, what is he doing? Aha, bishop f4. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, but of course, you, you have to be very careful with black if you take on b2, by the way. Because if you go to take on b2, there's always going to be moments the queen gets in and forks everything and threatens to win everything. And why does it pass c-pawn? I mean, it's, it's really no joke. So... Probably shoot off didn't play. Okay. So now if you take the rook, bishop b8, and if you take on e4 or something like this, I mean, black plays knight g6 and has the bishop and the knight versus the rook. And I guess this position is just good for black, even though it looks pretty active for white. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I meant to say, actually. Uh, sometimes I talk too fast, but sometimes I say exactly what I mean. So we have queen d7. Now, queen d7. Okay. Fork. Now, knight g6 obviously makes sense, because if queen a7, you take this. But now, what about bishop to d6? Okay, well, now there's a rook hanging and a bishop hanging. So, black will obviously move the rook, because you, you really, you don't want to play this. I mean, that's depressing. Bishop f8, queen b7, you don't want to do that. So, anyway, so in this position, black... What? Is this joke getting old? I mean, you just leave everything hanging? Yeah e3 what why didn't he play rook e8 here and e3 because then there is bishop g3 holding this diagonal and monitoring the movement of the knight and pawn f2 bishop f2 and white is safe the reason shirov has to start his combination with this amazing move is because if you take with the rook i take your rook and if you don't take i take and i fork you and if you take like this, then, and only then, black moves the rook and says, you want my bishop? Go and get it. Now, knight h4. And there is nothing that stops this. Nothing. Okay, queen takes f7, check. King f7, rook f1, rook f2, sacrificing both your rooks and your queen. But that's basically nothing. e3. What an amazing move. And in this position, Shadij played rook f1. Check. King hides. But just rook e8. Once again, leaving everything hanging. You can choose what you'd like to take. He chooses to take nothing. Because if he takes the bishop, then there is this beautiful queen c1. Rook c1, rook e1. Oopsies. And then if he takes the rook... There is this beautiful queen c1, rook e1, uh, rook c1, rook e1. Yeah. So rook d1, bishop b8, and now, well, we just take. And we have two pieces, we have a pass pawn, and, uh, well, you, by the way, also have queen e5 and mate. Unstoppable mate, by the way. So g3, bishop g3. And in this position, Ivan Sharish resigned to Alexei Shirov. And that is how you beat a 2650 GM with the black pieces in 30 moves. And it's not even really 30 moves, it's more like 23. Because already at this point the game is lost. Um, 20, like 22 moves. Unbelievable. You play directly into something he has played before and studied, but you know it better, and you manage the dynamics of the position better, and you win like that. Yeah, crazy stuff. Now, I'd like to show you a fun game uh, from the Women's Grand Swiss. This is uh, Alexandra Kostinuk versus Vantika Agrawal, who I believe is um, just one of the many rising stars of India, WIM, rated like 23-something. 
Uh, this was a Sicilian defense, bishop b5 check. So Kostinuk chooses not to play into uh, main line with d4, and we get a very close line. We get a line, by the way, if you're wondering if this is hanging, uh, there is d4 and rook e1, and I mean, rook e1 first, then d4, and the white just gets a very strong initiative. So you, you have to be very careful when you take. We get a very close structure. So uh, we get c4, e4, and finally we have d4, but at a much later moment. Now, the most interesting part about this game begins right here, because what do you do if you're playing with white? White needs to come up with a game plan. Well, Alexandra plays king h1. Do you understand the idea of king h1? The king has had enough. The king doesn't want to be part of this anymore. It wants to go off the board. Eh. Eh. Unfortunately, it's unable to break through that wall. So instead, uh, what she's going to do is she's going to try to create an attack with the F and G pawns potentially in the future. Something, maybe, along those lines. Uh, here, Vantika should stay patient, but she plays e5. Now, when you look at the move e5, you know what white's next move is. You know. Of course you know what white's next move is. White is going to play knight f5. And you basically need to evaluate whether or not allowing knight f5 is good or bad. Clearly, black is unafraid. So, Alexandra plays bishop g5, baits the move h6, and backs up. And she's like, okay, now you might have a target here, g4, g5 in the future. This entire game is basically played with the F and G file in mind, okay? I want you to just pay attention. Most of this game is just played with this, these two files in mind. G4. B5. Now, I, I know black is created counterplay, but I mean for white. B5 is a good counterplay. Good counterplay move. F3. Bc4. Takes. And now she trades this and trades this. Now, you would think that you don't want to trade down, really, if you're trying to create an attack, right? Well, g5. Now, if black takes, then bishop g5. But the thing is, if black doesn't take, I mean, you're gonna... This is why you needed to make h6 a thing. Because now, when you force your opponent to play the pawn forward, this pawn actually forces a reaction. Knight h5, g h6, and you resign if you're playing with black. So, um, takes, takes. And here, Vantika plays a very bold move. She plays king f7. She's like, yo, who do you think you're attacking? Excuse me, I also have an open h-file. King f7, knight g6, blah, 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 knight h5, knight f4. I'm actually going to create the attack. So, Alexandra puts all her rooks on the g-file. I told you this whole game's about the g-file. She's like, okay, bishop f6, rook g7, knight h5. Now, black can also defend with rook h7 with the idea to play this and not take back, but play knight to f4, which is a very nice idea. Rook g7 check, looks like you're making progress, but you're not, because the king is actually completely safe. And now, this position is completely lost because there's a hanging queen and a hanging rook. So that's not good. Knight h5. And actually, it looks like black is making decent progress toward creating a blockade. But black is not creating a decent progress toward creating a blockade, because how is white going to open this up? One move, f4. If white can successfully play f4, this game is going to be over. So, as Kostinuk prepares her next idea, do you see what's coming, folks? Do you see what four of her pieces all fight for? Now three, now two actually, but oh, progress potentially being made. King g1, there it is. Uh-oh. Now, after king g1, uh, black had to continue to suppress this idea of f4. By maybe playing knight f6. But then I don't ima I imagine Alexandra might have played knight g3, queen e3, and f4. Or queen e2 and queen e2, queen e1, one of these moves, and f4. I mean, uh, probably queen e3, f4. It's very tough for black. Uh, and now that this happens, even with this pawn being won, the rest of this game is a hunt. Check. And now the bishop comes out of danger. The white king is protected from the queen. And now rook e5, with the idea to play rook e6. So we have uh, this, and the rook looks pretty under fire, so it's got to come back, right? No, knight b3. If you take, knight d4, and it gets even worse. The second Vantika looks to just, like, it, 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 it's, it's close. Maybe she's last-ditch effort to create a little bit of counterplay and confusion. Check. Here check so now you lose your queen 
And let me tell you something, I don't think you need your king in the middle of the board during a fight. And what ends up happening a few moves later is the king is checkmated. Here she resigned because her only move is king f5, and then there is queen g6 mate. Kind of rare that in the middle of a board with queens and rooks and knights and bishops that the king is the most centralized piece, but a very fun attacking game from Alexandra, who bounced back after losing yesterday to strong Georgian player uh, Nino uh, Batsashvili. So, yeah, I mean, I try to pick some of the most exciting games. Uh, this game was crazy. This one. Um, if you know, you know. If you don't know, you're about to find out. So, Badur Jababa is known for exotic openings. And literally the username Exotic Princess. Plays d4. Okay, that's kind of rare. The center game. Now here you can play the Goren Gambit, but he chooses to play knight f3. Now, here, black could play knight c6. I mean, this is obviously a main line, and now we're in a scotch. So we've played into a scotch. Uh, however, black chooses to play bishop b4. And Jobava here plays a move that I've never seen in my life. Um, you can probably play c3, you can play bishop d2, you can play queen d2, you can play king e2. He plays knight d2. So, according to the database, this has been played maybe 50 times. 50, 5 zero from this, which has been played 500 million times. Uh, and black here plays a novelty. So according to the database, I think knight c6 has been played. Black plays d5, breaking in the center with a pawn. So, so we officially on move four have a position that's never played before. That's nuts. Maybe online. I mean, I'm sure in some online games. But So Jobaba now takes this pawn. Because if, if black takes on e4, yeah, you cannot win a pawn back, but you're going to play c3. But maybe black can play e3. And if you take the bishop, there is a hanging knight and another hanging knight. So black gets a very nice position here. Um, and maybe even takes f2 first and then takes this. So, for some reason, uh, that didn't happen. Like, none of that happened. Black played knight e7, still a normal move. Uh, not knight f6, because then e5, I guess, is strong. Uh, but knight e7. So now we kick out this bishop, and we play knight b3. So we attack the bishop again. The bishop uh, here doesn't take on d4 and, and short castle, which I guess is natural, and goes back to b6. I guess Musar wanted to keep his bishop. Now Jabawa plays bishop g5. Uh, fascinating move. Still nothing is happening here with the pawns. If d e4, probably he would have played bishop c4. Um, I don't know what he would have played. Maybe queen c2, queen e4. But he's just giving a pawn. I mean, he's just gambiting. But black plays short castle. And now white takes. And white takes because black has a choice. He can play f6 and then take back. And I guess Jobava liked that this diagonal could be weak. Uh, black can also take like with the knight and lose his queen. <clears throat> and black can play rook e8, queen d5, like these two ideas. So if black plays queen d5, bishop e7, rook e8 is obviously the point. Um, and black uh, can play rook e8 first. At which point you know, you, bishop e2, queen d5 or something. But black chooses to play queen d5. Bishop e7, rook e8. However, white has a move here. And that move is knight e2. Not bishop e2, but knight e2, and suddenly there is a problem. Because if you play queen takes d1, rook d1, rook e7, you hang mate. That is not how the game ended. It's back rank mate after rook e8. It's not how the game ended. But what the hell do you do? Because now white is just up a piece. If you don't trade queens and take the bishop, you move your queen, white moves the bishop. So now, ladies and gentlemen, where do you move the queen? Where do you move the queen? Where, where do you move the queen? Are you losing? Are you, is it lost? What do you do? If you play like queen f5, for example, right? And white decides to rescue the bishop. Now, maybe you play knight c6. I mean, you're down a full piece. You've blundered. But do you have enough activity, enough pressure, that maybe white is actually not any better at all? I don't know. But black has to play the right queen move. And black plays queen h5. Okay. And white plays queen d2. And it's just going to castle long. But you know what else? Like, let's say black plays uh, knight c6. Continuing the attack on the bishop. 
Queen G5. Uh oh. If you trade queens and the queen and the bishop escapes, it's over. The game's over. So, Musar plays h6 to prevent anything from going to g5. But after knight c6, knight f4, he resigned. On move 14, he did not even get to play 14 moves. White played 14 moves, black played 13. Both of these guys are 2600 GMs, and black resigned. That's crazy. Now, what happened? Why, uh, why doesn't queen d2 just work against anything else? Because queen f5 creates a threat on f2. So Musard had to find a way out. I think he was sho so shocked by knight e2, he, he didn't recover. He just thought he was losing. That's really rare to see these kinds of games at GM level. Very rare stuff. So, yeah, crazy. Four, th 14, 13 and a half move win. 14 move win. Next game, Alexander Predka <coughs> versus Krishnan Sasikran from India. This is a youth versus experience. I think uh, Krishnan is uh, maybe in his 40s. Um, how old is Krishnan Sasikaran? I'm going to look this up in the middle of the recap. He is 40. Yeah, he's 40 years old. He's an he's a OG of, of, of the game. And Pratka is like 22 or something. He's super young. So we have a Nimso Indian defense. Uh, White plays a classical, e3. I think it's literally called the classical. Uh, castles, bishop d3. Now, play develops d5, knight f3, c5, castles, whatever. I mean, something where black takes every pawn and, you know, plays b6. Uh, or, I mean, hanging pawn structure and plays b6. So, like, this is normally what happens. Uh, but, uh, Pretke plays a3. Now, what do we know about Pretke? He likes to sack his queen. And he has good prep. So... If he likes to sack his queen and he has good preparation, you don't really want to get into a battle with a guy who has that. So he plays a3. It's not the most popular move. Takes, takes. And uh, in this position, there's a move that's played like all the time. And that move is c5. And in this position, instead of c5, Krishnan played the, the old school. And this is what I love. I love when like some of the older players, like, 40s play moves against the younger guys that like aren't in the database it's an interesting move e5 the idea is that he opens up his bishop and if you take after a queen trade not only do you lose one of your pawns you're just much worse here with white like this structurally is a terrible position because your your pawns on the queen side are split and the fact that you have a bishop pair doesn't mean anything so Pretka plays knight f3. He doesn't go for the damage of the structure. But now knight c6. <clears throat> so he's offering him to, d to, to d double his own c pawns, but basically render this bishop completely useless for the rest of the game. <clears throat> Instead of engaging with that, Pretka plays queen c2. But after takes takes knight g4, we have the same problem. So bishop 2e2... If knight e5, then this, and obviously white is happy, so queen d5. c4, whoa, takes, bishop b2, okay, so now our bishop is not so bad. And now in this position, white has a choice. White can either castle short, or take the knight and castle short. Obviously, you're not going to castle long because then knight takes f2. So Pratka... Okay. So in this position, Pratka is just down two pawns. Two pawns. Black has seven, white has five. Uh, in this position, the engine likes queen g5 a lot. Rook f2, queen e3 is the idea. And if rook to d5, queen g2, it, it, it just says, yo, black is up three pawns. Like, what is white doing? But Sasikran gives away his knight. So he decides to just go for the opposite colored bishop position. And we have a position where black maintains a two-pawn advantage. And white just goes for an attack. So white tries to get aggressive and is just kind of belligerently going on the attack. Here's the problem. White, ha uh, white has no attack. If anybody has an attack here, it's the guy who's defending a pawn on d3 and the king is just... The last line of defense. I mean, the king is stopping the wall from collapsing. I don't really think that's supposed to happen. And 
for the duration of this game, Sasekiran was just stabilizing his position and then waiting for the moment to break. He then plays queen d5. He plays c5. And if en passant were to be played, queen c6, rook b8, I mean, the queen is getting in. It's, it's very bad news. Uh, and he, you know, he's just breaking. a6. Pretka plays g5. He takes e4. Crazy stuff. But all the pawns in white's position are falling. All of them. And even though you can finally win a couple pawns back, check here, rook b5, black is still up two pawns. I mean, black is still up two pawns, and the pressure is all over the place. I mean, it's... it's, it's at, at any moment, you can get hit from all angles. Rook d2, rook b3, queen c5, and now takes, takes, takes. And black is still up two pawns, but... Do you trade queens? No! <laughs> Why? Opposite colored bishops. You never know if even an opposite colored bishop endgame with two pawns. For example, I'll give, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, this endgame might not even be a win. This, th this might not even be winning for black, even though black has two pawns extra. So you need your pieces on the board. Queen g4. You need your pieces on the board because now you trade in an advantageous way. Why is this advantageous? You have a protected pass pawn two squares away from becoming a queen, which will require attention of your opponent for the rest of the game. And now Krishnan says, I'm going to play a position with zero risk of making a draw because I have two passers side by side. And on move 53, once one of those passers got through, king g3, rook g1, Pretka resigned. Clean game from Krishnan Sasikiran. Super clean. Began all the way back here. This move a3, slight wrinkle in the opening, and he, he fires off e5, e4, and with the threat even of damaging his own structure, plays against the bad Nimso bishop, which never got activated. And uh, you know what's crazy? That bishop ended up dying. That bishop almost served like no role in this entire game. Amazing game from him. Uh, super high understanding of the position. And, uh, well, we'll talk about it later, but he's tied for first after six rounds, Krishnan. He has six and a half points. He beat Fedeseev yesterday. And the final game I would like to show you, Maxim Vashelegrav versus Pavel Pankratov. The winner of this game will be tied for first after six rounds. And the Frenchman plays e4, and the Russian plays a French. What the, the hell is going on? So, what do you, how, how do you beat a guy who plays the French? Advance. Okay. C5. It's all main line. Bishop d3, interesting. So this is actually a gambit. The milner Barry gambit. And the milner Barry gambit is cd4, cd4. Bishop d7 to prevent any tricks with bishop b5. And then knight d4. This is the milner Barry. However, MVO plays something I've never seen in my life. He doesn't take back on d4. I've never seen this before. I've never seen this before. Black plays bishop d7 because naturally if cd4, you need to have that diagonal protected of this bishop. MVL doesn't even take. I've never seen this in my life. I've played chess 20 years. I've never seen this in my life. Huh? Now, knight e7, because black wants to put a knight on f5 and support the center, and this bishop will be... Or knight g6 and bishop e7. Now, what does MVL play here? Well, he plays h4. You know what the most insane thing about this position is? It's been played like 50 times, 60 times in the database. 90% of those games were played in Title Tuesday and online Blitz games. What the hell do these GMs know that I don't? Gawain Jones won a game in the Isle of Man, I think in 2019, or the Gibraltar tournament. He had the white pieces, it was a classical game. What the hell? That move is designed against knight g6, by the way, because you're gonna play h5. You're just gonna gain space and kick the knight back. So, Pankratov plays h6, and now MVL is like, well, I'm still not gonna take back, so I'm just gonna play a3. Okay, now Pront Karat, like, the, 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 the biggest tension here between the pawns, just someone kiss someone already, all right? Like, someone do something. No, b4. No one's doing anything. He's, he's not taking. No one's taking. They're too stubborn. a6 to prevent b5. You think one of them is going to run out of moves? Bishop to b2. I mean, okay, now black has to do something because the pressure on the pawn. You can't just let him play cd4. You got to play dc. He plays g5. Are you kidding me? g5? How does that move make any sense? Well, it makes sense like this, because if white gobbles, 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 then believe it or not, you've actually destabilized your own center. You can't play this move, because then you actually get hit with this move, and then you die. So, can't do that. 
So, what do you do against G5? I have a question for you, ladies and gentlemen. What square did G5 weaken? Correct. F6. Now do something about it. Now do something about it. Oh, that's easy, Gotham. I just on Poussin. No, stupid. That doesn't even... What? They're not even on the same... What? No, if you actually thought that, you should be ashamed. And you know what? This video will have like 250, 300,000 views or something. I guarantee one of you actually thought you could on Poussin and get to that square. I guarantee it. Admit it in the comments. No. Knight h2. Professional move. Knight g4, knight f6 is the idea. Bishop g7. I'm not stopping. Now... If you play h5 thinking you're so clever, I'm going to jump right in there. And more on that later, because even though he took on h4 here, now MDL takes on d4. And here, I'm actually kind of surprised that Pankratov didn't play knight d4. Uh, I don't know if it like loses, and I just don't understand anything about chess, but it seems like a move he has to play. Maybe he thought it was a little too dangerous. Um, he didn't like something like knight f6, bishop f6, ef6, like this. Uh... Maybe it's a bit too dangerous. Something like knight f5. There is just too much pressure on his position with the bishops. But the engine after bishop f6, ef6 gives one of the most egregious computer moves I've ever seen in my life. So ef6, the engine here says h3. That's probably a top five scumbag computer move I have ever seen. Do you want to know what the idea of that move is? So if you just take the knight, rook g8, you have no convenient way to stop this attack. If you play g3, rook takes g3, and if you take knight e2 double check and queen f2 on the next move, and if you play king f1, that's mate, that's mate, the game is over. So you can't do that. And if you take the pawn, well that's, I mean, you kind of get the point. Uh, you're gonna get butchered in the same way h3 are you kidding me i mean if you play h3 over the board you get scanned with a metal detector after the game they scan you pankratov did not see this and clearly neither did mvl or else he would have gone for this h5 and that allows this but of course the game is not over i mean the game is far from over black is going for f6 so you defend it black is going for f6 so you take a free pawn what where's the free pawn queen d5 <laughs> queen it's free it's pinned Okay, so, knight f6, queen g5. Look at this queen. Vroom, vroom. Oh, sorry, that's not how queens move. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Queen f3, queen d5, queen g5. Hits both pieces. How do you defend them? Actually, good question. How do you defend Knight g4, okay. MVL's like, all right, it's move 21. I should probably develop my queen's knight. Kids are watching. Knight c3, with the threat of being the next piece to arrive on d5, and attack this, and go into f6, potentially. But there's also d5. Queen d8. Now, what do you do when you're attacking? Do you trade queens? No, of course. You do trade queens if you're 2800, almost. Knight e4. You know where that knight's going, folks? Either here or here. I got bad news. You got to choose one with black. You got to choose one way to die. What? You can't stop both. So black plays e5. That actually does prevent rook d6. Tries to activate one of the knights in the middle and get some counterplay. And MVL plays f3. Attacks the knight. Knight takes d4, f takes g4, sacrificing a piece out of a degree of desperation, and knight f7, and Pavel Pankratov resigned. 26 moves, but is this game considered perfect? Is this game considered a perfect game? Considering there was this h3. If a tree falls in the forest, no one is there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. If both players blunder h3 and one of them wins a beautiful game because of it and the other one doesn't find it, a way to hold on. Is the game a perfect game? I don't know. I'll let you debate that in the comments. But after six rounds of the Grand Swiss, Ali Reza Firuja maintains a lead with four and a half out of six, but he is joined by his countryman, Maxim Vashilagrav, who won this game and tied for first. Krishnan Saskiran, Alexei Shirov, and Yevgeny Nair. Yevgeny Nair is 44. Shirov, I. How old is Alexei Shirov? Alexei Shirov. Alexei Shirov is 49, and Sasikran is 40. I mean, that's sick. That's awesome. And, um, yeah, that's the end of today's recap. Five more rounds to go, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and we will know the top two and who makes it to the candidate. Peace out, y'all. Get out of here.